I needed to make some large poster frames for work because I have a big mouth and sometimes volunteer myself for things that I don't actually have time for. I figured as long as I was doing things that I don't have time for, I should also make a video showing the build process, since I'm sure there aren't already enough videos showing how to make picture frames. I was on a little bit of a time crunch, and I wanted to stay size compatible with some of the other frames in the building. I didn't want to risk getting any of the measurements wrong, so I started out by designing the frames in Microsoft Visio. Visio isn't really designed for this type of work, but it's pretty good for two-dimensional scale drawings, and it's what I already had on my computer. One of these days I'm going to learn CAD software, but it's not at the top of my list of priorities. It's often the case in woodworking that there exists a tool specifically designed for the job that you're doing, but the most practical solution is usually just to use the tools that you already got. Each frame used almost a full 8 foot long rock maple 1x6, picked up from Home Depot. I did the initial rough cuts on the bandsaw rather than the table saw, partially because I wanted to minimize saw curve waste, but mostly because I wanted to avoid kickback in case there was any built-in tension in the wood. Sometimes when you're ripping wider boards to length, the cut ends can pinch together onto the blade. The bandsaw is just as capable of cutting off my fingers as a table saw, but because it's a thin curved blade that cuts straight down rather than towards you, you don't really have to worry as much about kickback from the blade getting pinched and the unlikely chance that it does start to bind, I can just stop the saw. After everything was cut to rough width, I went over to the jointer to straighten out any edge warping, and also to clean up the rough cuts from the bandsaw. I was lucky enough not to get any significant bowing on the face side, otherwise I might have had to start over with another board, since I wanted these to be 3 quarters of an inch thick. I normally mill my own lumber instead of buying it already surfaced, partially because I like to square up my own edges for a clean start to the project, and also because I'm less lazy than I am frugal. With one edge of each piece jointed, I felt a little more comfortable going to the table saw to make a clean rip on the opposite edge. I still didn't completely trust the stability of the wood since I hadn't been able to give it much time to acclimate in my workshop conditions after leaving the climate controlled hardware store. A few days probably would have been enough, but I had a few hours. Play it safe, I left enough wood to predictably account for any warping, so I ended up ripping maybe a sixteenth of an inch wider than the final width. This turned out to be a smart move because several of the boards warped again, just enough to need another light pass through the jointer. In hindsight, it probably would have been better to let the board sit for an hour or so after rough cutting, just to make sure all the surface tension worked its way out. The table saw cuts were pretty clean, and I probably could have just sanded everything smooth at the end, but I decided to give everything a light pass through the thickness planer to get all of my edges perfectly consistent. I used duct tape to hold multiple boards together so I could plane them in groups. All it took was one light pass at the thickness planer to get everything down to a consistent two inches. The boards were already close to their final length, and I didn't want to take any chances with snipe, so I fed in a sacrificial board at the beginning and the end of each cut. This helps maintain consistent upward pressure on the planer body throughout the cut, which usually prevents that little uneven part at the beginning and the end of each board that you normally get with portable thickness planers. Now that most of the easy stuff was done, it was time to cut the miters. You might notice that I'm not using the miter saw directly behind me, which is specifically designed for cutting miters. There are a few reasons for that. First, I don't have it equipped with a zero clearance plate and fence, which can lead to chipping, especially when dealing with something like hard maple. Second, the positive stops on the miter scale are almost perfect, but not perfect. So even though I can get perfect 45 degree miters to the right side, I have to fiddle with it when I'm cutting 45s to the left. Third, I don't have a good lockdown mechanism for the board, so it's easier for them to slide in the middle of a miter cut. Hard maple slides very well on smooth aluminum, and if you're cutting 45 degrees to the left or the right, it's going to pull to the left or right accordingly. All these issues are avoided by simply using my sliding miter saw jig for the table saw. It's made out of MDF, so it cuts down on some of the smoothness. There's a little more surface friction there. I cut one side of the miter on the right side of the jig, and then I move it over to the opposite side to cut the matching piece. Because I know that the jig is exactly 90 degrees in the middle, I get perfect miters every time simply by cutting mating corners on opposite sides of the jig. Normally I use this jig for smaller frames, so the sliding T-track that holds the stop block was way too short. 
Fortunately, I had an extra four foot T-Track on hand since I try to pick up some spares when they go on sale, so it was easy enough to swap that out for these frames. This was a good time to start cutting out the rabbits in the back of the frame to hold the poster and acrylic sheet in place. You can cut the rabbits before cutting the miters, but I usually try to cut the miters before doing any edge detail on the board. The main reason for this is support. I want to prevent chipping on the corners. I had that nice zero clearance jig on the table saw, but if the frames already had any curves or notches cut in them, those areas wouldn't be able to contact the zero clearance part of the jig, so there wouldn't be any support and chipping could occur. If you don't have a choice, like if you're working with picture frame stock that already has a profile cut in it, you can try to cut some filler blocks to stick behind the board and cut down on the chipping. When I say that this was hard maple, I'm referring not only generically to the species, but also to the fact that this was some seriously hard maple. I was taking light passes to safely work my way up to the final depth, but no matter how shallow of a cut I took, I was still getting some tear out in certain parts of the top edge. Most of the boards were fine, but a couple chipped out enough during the slow, shallow final cut that I decided to go just a little bit deeper and make a couple passes going the wrong direction along the fence. Pushing a board right to left along the router table fence is correct from a safety perspective because the cutting edge is cutting towards you, just like when you're pushing a board into the table saw. Moving the board left to right along the fence is a little more dangerous for the same reason you don't want to push a board in from the back side of the table saw. A 3 horsepower router will snatch a board right out of your hands and throw it across the room, hopefully without taking any part of you with it. Sometimes it's necessary though, like when you're getting a lot of chipping, so if you're going to go the wrong way on the router table, make sure you understand what could happen and make sure you're taking extremely light passes. I actually forgot to film the backwards cut, so you just watch that same clip again in reverse. As long as I was at the router table, I switched over to my 45 degree chamfer bit to take off some of the sharp edges. I'm trying to stay close to the design of some other maple in the area where these frames will be displayed, so I'm keeping the edge detail pretty simple. After seeing how easily some of these boards were chipping, even with a sharp straight bit and a light pass, I just cut all of the chamfers going the wrong way against the fence, meaning left to right, so the bit was cutting in towards the face of the board rather than scooping out. The probability of the bit snatching the board away from me was extremely low since I wasn't using a feather board or anything to pin the board against the fence, so even if the bit did grab the board, it probably would have just pushed it away from the fence and stopped the problem right there. It normally makes sense to check your miters right after you cut them, but because of the size of these frames, I didn't have a good flat surface to do it. They're wider and longer than my workbench, so I had to wheel over my table saw and add some shims until the frame was sitting reasonably flat. Then I pulled out my longest band clamp, which is also my only band clamp, and found that if the frames had been a half inch longer in either direction, my clamp probably would not have fit. So I obviously planned this perfectly. I saved all of the scrap cutoffs from when I cut the miters so that I could sell them on Etsy as artisanal minimalist Christmas trees since I recently bought a used ebook on Craigslist that said that idiots will buy almost anything if you market it right. In the meantime, I thought they might be useful for aligning the corners while I was gluing the frame together. I put a little painter's tape on each one to keep it from getting stuck and so it would be easy to reset the surface when doing the second frame. Again, because of the space issue, I could only glue one frame at a time. During most parts of a woodworking project, you want to take your time, relax, be safe, and treat each piece of the project as if it was its own project. Larger complex glue-ups are kind of an exception because you're on a countdown timer, and if you move too slowly and that glue sets up, your project might get ruined. If you didn't take enough time to repair the area where you're going to assemble everything, your project might get ruined. If you didn't dry fit everything before you start slapping on glue, your project might get ruined. If your house catches on fire when you're 75% done with the glue job, you might walk out of there with third degree burns and a 100% completed glue job because that's how focused you are throughout that entire process. This could have been done in a different order, but I decided to glue up the frame before cutting the reinforcing splines for the corners. The splines can help line everything up while you're gluing, but they can also get in the way of the clamps and add additional surfaces to your short glue timeline. So, 
I prefer to just let the frame sit a little bit longer after I glue it up and then cut the splines later. You can also use biscuits or dowels to help line everything up, but this is just how I chose to do it this time. There's really no wrong way to do this as long as you're comfortable with the process and it turns out right. After the frame was contained by the band clamp and I adjusted all of the corners so the boards met in the same 90 degree point, I clamped on my triangles to ensure the faces were aligned. After that I measured the diagonals to make sure they were identical and double checked that with a trustworthy square. It's kind of a small square and a large framing square would have covered more surface area but I've actually never seen a framing square that was close enough to perfection that I'd use it for woodworking. Before walking away I used some of the pieces from the other frame as winding sticks to make sure the frame was sitting perfectly flat while it dried. I had to shim up one corner a little bit until both of the winding sticks lined up perfectly. If I hadn't done that the frame would have come out of the clamps with a slight twist. After taking each frame out of the clamps, I carefully scraped off any glue squeeze out and lightly sanded to get rid of any unevenness. Then I repeated the process for gluing up the other frame, and much to my delight, both frames turned out identical, with equal diagonal measurements and perfect 90 degree corners. This is part of why I was so picky about using my miter cutting table saw sled in the beginning. Especially on a larger frame like this, if any of the miters were not exactly 45 degrees, or if any side of the frame was a different length than the matching piece on the opposite side, even by an eighth of an inch, these sides would not have lined up this well. Wood glue is very strong, and these miters fit together perfectly, but it's a very bad idea to leave glued miters with no kind of mechanical reinforcement. Miters are kind of unique in the way they expand and contract, and I can use Visio to show what I mean. Wood doesn't really expand or contract much across its length with climate changes, but it does change across the width. Look at what happens to this miter when one of the frame sides shrinks a little bit because the air conditioning in my office dehumidifies the air to a lower level than the humidity in my non-climate controlled workshop. The outside corner maintains contact, but the inside corner pulls away, and this is why so many picture frames fail. I normally use wooden splines in the corners with the grooves cut out on the table saw. This is pretty easy to do, but since I don't build picture frames very often, I always end up using some kind of a temporary jig for each project. My last jig was too risky for frames of this size, so I spent the weekend building this overkill spline jig out of Baltic birch plywood with a removable zero clearance insert for cleaner cuts. This will work great for picture frames, and I can also use it for boxes. It's an optional step, but before using the jig, I switched out my multi-purpose table saw blade for a ripping blade. The main difference is that the teeth on a multi-purpose blade are cut at an angle to reduce chipping with cross cuts, but the rip teeth are square at the end. Either blade would work fine, but the square teeth on the ripping blade will leave a flat bottom cut, which means you got a cleaner looking joint without having to chisel inside of a narrow groove. I wanted the spline to start one quarter of an inch from the face of the frame, so I adjusted one of the clamp blocks to be one quarter of an inch from the blade and then carefully carried over the frame to clamp it in place. In case you're wondering, the top of the frame was about seven and a half feet from the ground, so this would not have worked very well at my last house where my garage ceiling was seven feet tall. Since not all of my viewers measure things in feet, that's approximately 14 hands, or just about 2.3 meters. I was using a thin curved blade and I wanted to use a thicker spline, so I had to shift everything over just a little and make another pass. There was a paper thin leaf left in the middle after the second cut and rather than doing another round of cuts on the table saw I just sliced it out with a chisel. That gave me a good chance to inspect each corner at the same time to make sure that everything was cut clean and even. This is a good time to plane the corner spline to its final thickness. 
I'm using purple heart for the spline, and I'm using a piece of scrap wood as a sacrificial board to make sure I don't get any snipe on the end of the piece of purple heart. This piece has to be just right, or else it won't work right. If it's too thin, you'll have a weak joint. If it's too thick, or just barely fits, you'll end up damaging the frame trying to force the spline in after putting glue on all the mating surfaces. You have a good fit when the spline slides in easily, but doesn't wobble around in the joint. I cut the splines to their approximate size on the scroll saw, leaving them a little oversized so I have some room for error during installation. The extra gets trimmed off later after the glue is dry, so it doesn't really matter how much extra you leave as long as you leave enough. As a bonus, I ended up with a leftover piece that I can use to make a nice wooden replica of Charlie Brown's shirt. Everyone has their own way of managing excess glue, but for spline corners, I prefer to use painter's tape around the opening. You'll either spend more time preparing before applying the glue, or you spend more time cleaning up after. It doesn't take long to put the tape on there, and it makes it a lot easier to clean up so you can move on to the next one. Whenever you're inserting a piece of wood into a mating joint, you always want to glue both surfaces. A lot of the glue is going to get scraped off when you're pushing the pieces together, and by coating all surfaces you make sure you don't end up with any dry spots. It might seem like clamping would be unnecessary with this type of joint, since everything fits together so well. But keep in mind that you just introduced moisture to four mating surfaces. That means they're going to swell a little bit, and that swelling can push the joint open at the corners, creating a slight gap between the spline and the frame. Clamping is going to prevent that. Unless you have a deep bevel or other complicated profile on the outside of the frame, the easiest way to cut off the excess spline material is on the router table, paying careful attention to the grain direction in the spline. If you cut towards the corner, you could chip it out. It's better to start at the corner, making sure the cutting edge is going downhill on the spline's grain, and then flip the frame over to cut the other side. These are going to get mounted in a high traffic area, so I decided to go with keyhole hangers instead of picture frame wire or sawtooth hangers to hang it on the wall. The keyhole hangers require a little more work and attention to detail to get both frames perfectly level and on the same horizontal plane, but they'll hold up better if the frames ever get bumped, which is almost guaranteed to happen. I'm marking these so the center of the screw is exactly 12 inches from the top of the frame. That way the mounting screws on the wall can just go one foot below wherever I want the top of the frame to be. The keyhole hangers could just be screwed onto the back surface of the frame, but I'm going to mortise them into the frame so they sit flush with the surface. That way, in case anybody ever looks at the back of the frame, they probably won't care or even notice realistically. But the mortise can also help make sure everything is lined up the same, because again, if one of these holes or the corresponding screws on the wall are a little bit off, horizontally or vertically, the frames won't hang right. I'm going to cut the mortise using a handheld router and this jig that I'm making with the drill press. I marked the ends of the keyhole hanger on a piece of plywood and then used a Forstner bit to drill out the waste. I added a fence to the side of the jig to keep everything aligned horizontally and then secured the jig with a pair of clamps and cut the mortise using a top bearing bit in my router. 
This is where the mortise really shows its practical benefits. Drill bits tend to wander, especially the smaller bits, so I'm using a self-centering drill bit to pre-drill the holes, and all I need to do is drop the keyhole hanger inside the mortise to guide the bit. Even if the holes end up being a little bit off, the hanger isn't going to move when I tighten down the screws. The last thing that's really missing for the keyhole hangers is the part in the middle for the head of the screw. I cut that out on the drill press with the Forstner bit. I had to pull over my router cable and use a box of diapers to keep everything level. The diapers were also very helpful in allowing me to finish the entire project with no breaks. The last piece of hardware I needed to add was these turn buttons for holding everything inside the frame. These are pretty easy to install, I just needed to drill a bunch of small holes on the drill press. Now these are number four screws, which means very small, and they're very easy to strip or break, especially when working with a hardwood like maple. This is why I always keep a small bag of number four steel wood screws in the shop. Add a little paste wax to the tip and you can pre-thread the screw holes so the final screws go in easier. And now for the worst part of every woodworking project, sanding. These were already in pretty good shape though, so I went straight to 220 grit. It was almost time for finishing, but the main enemy of any finishing job is airborne contaminants, usually dust. And it's also usually the thing that you make a lot of right before finishing, so I spent the next hour with the air compressor, dust collection system, and air filtration unit running while I tried to remove any potentially problematic speck of dust from my workshop, which is kind of like trying to remove all the nasty from a septic tank. I don't have a dedicated spray booth, and even if I did have one, I don't have a good place to set one up. After all the dust settled and I vacuumed the floor one last time, I pushed my table saw and router table to the most convenient location I could find and covered them with clean plastic. That was going to be my finishing surface. I'm using a water-based polyurethane to finish these frames, and since water-based finishes raise the grain and make it rough, I like to start by wiping on a wash coat of 50% water-based poly mixed with 50% water. The main thing the water does in this case is prevents the finish from drying too quickly and leaving streaks that will appear in the final coat. I wipe it on, immediately wipe it off, and then give everything a light hand sanding once it's dry. I'm using my Fuji Q4 Pro HVLP sprayer, that's high volume, low pressure, to apply the polyurethane. One of the things I really like about spraying water-based polyurethane is that it dries very quickly so I can apply multiple thin coats in succession without an extended wait time in between. Another nice thing is that it's less toxic than a lot of other solvent-based finishes would be. That doesn't mean that I want to hang around and huff the fumes after I'm done, but it's nice to finish a job and still be able to pronounce my name. I gave everything a couple hours to dry and then returned with a brown paper bag. With water-based polyurethane, you shouldn't use steel wool to remove all the little fuzzies at the end of the job, because you don't want tiny little steel particles in a water-based finish. I don't actually know if it causes any noticeable problem with rust discoloration, but old-timer woodworker wisdom has always been to use a brown paper bag to buff out water-based finishes. Paper is fibrous and therefore mildly abrasive, but it won't scratch up your finish unless you press too hard or leave any major creases on the bottom. Just like if you were rubbing on the last coat of an oil finish, you want to ball up your crumpled paper bag so you have an even surface on the bottom. The last step in the project, aside from installation, which I'm not going to cover, is to install all of the hardware, including the keyhole hangers and the turn buttons. Keyhole hangers are pretty simple, just make sure that the narrow end is up, because that's what's going to hold the screw in place. And for the turn buttons, you want to apply the right amount of torque. Too little, and they might open up after the frame is mounted, they'll just drop free. Too tight, and they'll be difficult to move. It's easy enough to fix later, but it's easier to get it right the first time. 
As tends to be the case with picture frames, I spent 80% of the project thinking that I was 80% finished with the project, but there are a lot of little details after those initial miter cuts are done. Not including the spline jig, which was a weekend all by itself, this probably took three days of frequently interrupted work to complete and entirely occupied my workshop until they were delivered and out of my way. It was a fun project though and very satisfying to see the end result. Also, I finally got a cool spline jig, so that's a big win. I guess I'll finally stop talking now and let you look at the pictures. Thanks for watching. If you're expecting a joke about me getting framed, forget it. I still have some comedic standards.